Now for a movie rant break, One Up presents a movie rant break. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the movie rant break. Got another dope episode today, like we always do over here at the movie rant break. (laughs) Shut the fuck up. Got John Smith in the building. Hey, you already know what the fuck going on. It's John Smith. We in this bitch. You already know what the fuck it is. So today, we're picking up where we left off from Lord of the Rings Fellowship, the Fellowship of the Ring we, that we already reviewed. Today, we're picking up at the Two Towers. If you haven't went and seen that episode yet and you are a Lord of the Rings fan, make sure you go tap into that first because we might reference that a few times here. So definitely want to have seen that for Shelly. We did, I think, a good job. You're oh, we killed that shit. For a... I'm not the Lord of the Rings fan. John Smith is a Lord of the Rings fan. And I think we did a good job. You good. were satisfied. I was very satisfied. Okay. We had a couple of viral clips from there, you know? We did. One went, we got a little quarter mil, a couple of them. Yeah. We are doing our thing. So today, like I said, get into the two towers. Let me get into this here. Directed by Peter Jackson, screenplay by Fran Walsh, Philippa Boyens, Stephen Sinclair, and Peter Jackson. It was based on the J.R.R. Tolkien novel, The Two Towers, produced by Barry M. Osborne, Fran Walsh, and Peter Jackson. Starring Elijah Wood, Ian McKellen, Liv Tyler, Vigo. Is it Vigo or Vigo? Vigo Mortensen, Sean Astin, Kate Blanchett. John Rise Davies, Bernard Hill, Christopher Lee, Billy Boyd, Dominic Monaghan, excuse me, Orlando Bloom, Hugo Weaving, Miranda Otto, David Wenham, Brad Dorif, Carl Urban, Andy Circus, and I'm sure some other ones that aren't on that list. There's a lot of it was a big cast. The fact that Andy Circus is that low on that list is mind blowing. It's okay. Cinematography by Andrew Lesney, edited by Michael J. Horton, music by Howard Shore. Did a good job. It was released back in December 18th, 2002 in the U.S. I think the opening premiere was December 5th of 02. The runtime for the regular cut is 179 minutes, which is almost three hours. We're reviewing the extended cut to be more inclusive, if you will. And that is four hours. Yeah. I think that's the exact time. Let me see what would I have it at. Yeah, three hours and 56 minutes for the extended cut. The budget for the two towers was $94 million. Box office, $947.9 million. It's pretty substantial, you could say. Extremely substantial, yeah. You know what the reception was? Very good. Was IMDb 8.8 out of 10. Ron Tomatoes 95. They ain't ain't playing games. I feel like it's fair. This is, I feel like it's fair to say, the best of the trilogy and of The Hobbit as well. It's the best J.R.R. Tolkien film adaptation. Yes. So do you want to hit people with a brief breakdown? Yeah, brief breakdown. Um, Frodo and Sam are now separate from the squad, and they're working their way to try to get to Mordor. Um, That's their goal. And uh, in the meantime, uh, the the little squadron of the trio, uh, the little trio, you know, the the dwarf, the man, and the elf, you know, are uh, on their own quest and end up helping. One sector of men in Rohad. They help Rohad. Vague. I I mean, you got to keep it brief. Um, But yeah, that's pretty much it. Word. Okay, so like we said, we're reviewing the extended cut. The extended cut for me is the first watch. You've seen the extended cut? I have watched this extended cut before, yes. How many times? Maybe twice. What about the other ones? I'm sure I asked you on the other. So I've watched probably more than anything. I've watched the Fellowship of the Ring extended cut. And and I'm actually happy that you mentioned this because like I honestly think that the theatrical cut 
of this specific movie is way better than the extended cut. And I know fans of the series are going to be mad at me about that. But I really think that this extended cut struggles from pacing problems um, that aren't existent in the theatrical cut. This movie, the, one of the best things about this movie is that every single scene is so captivating. And there's so many parts of this extended cut that just drag and that are not captivating. And that takes away, I think, from what makes it so good. Yeah, like there's a lot of cool lore, lore uh, uh, like things from lore. And like, um, there was a couple of scenes that I appreciated. Yeah. But- I definitely agree that the, it did struggle with pacing and it took you out of the excitement that made this film so great to begin with. Yes. It was, it's a whole extra 56 minutes. Yeah. And Fellowship of the Ring, I think the extended cut does a pretty good job at giving you more, but not taking away from what there was. This movie gives you more, but takes away from what comes with that theatrical cut, I believe. Um, doesn't mean that the all the extended scenes are bad, but a lot of them are comedy. I don't know if you noticed that, but like the majority of the extended cut scenes are just for humor. Um, and I think that did it justice to take some of that out because it's such a grim part of the story of the you know the journey. And to have it be broken up with so much humor all the time that wasn't really that funny, but had some like decent moments. I, and then like, like we'll go into more depth about the ones that we both agree on. I think that are valuable extended cut. I mean, we can scenes, just, we can hit the extended cut overview type shit now because I, I yeah. my rating for the film is going to be more on the original film as, than in, the, as is mine. Uh, but the there was one conversation between the steward of uh, Gondor, Gondor and his Gondor. son sons. That was cool. That was taking in place in the outskirts of the city or whatever. It's Asgiliath. Yeah. yeah, this other sub suburb of Gondor, mm-hmm. kind of. Yeah. Uh, talking about how the leader of Rivendell, I forget his name. Uh, you, you're talking about um, the elves? Yeah, the leader. You're talking about Mr. Smith? Agent yeah. Smith? Agent Smith. He's calling for this meeting and... <laughs> The steward is talking to Boromir, I think. Yeah, he's talking to Boromir and Faramir. Yeah, and how he wants to get the ring for Gondor and how it will help them prevail through the battle for Middle Earth and shit, which I thought was a. I think if that was the only scene that they added, that and I like when Legolas and Gimli go over their death count. Mm -hmm. I know that was a comedic thing, like you said, but if those two scenes are added, and that was it. I would have been pumped because mm-hmm. I feel like that those two scenes could have been added. Because I always liked the the banter that Legolas and Gimli have when they're fighting, and you never hear what their final death count is. And you did in this, and it made me really happy because I hadn't seen that before. Yeah the the um the scene with Faramir and, and Boromir, I, I really think that it adds more depth to that dynamic, that family dynamic, because we see some of it, a lot of it in the next movie, obviously. Um, but we don't really understand Boromir as a character outside of his dealings with the Fellowship. Yeah. And I think that gives more depth to his character, seeing that he was this leader of Gondor and that people looked up to him. And he was he was the thing that, you know, everyone in Gondor wanted to be type of thing. You know, it gives you more of that depth, to not that he's just some fuck up who was along for the ride for um, the the journey of the Fellowship, but then like tried to take the ring, et cetera, et cetera. I think he always got a bad rap, but I think that that scene in in and of itself helps you kind of paint this picture of Boromir being this war hero. You know, um, I, I like that a lot. And there was one other scene I'm trying to remember what it was, but there was one other scene. Oh, the scene that when um uh Eowyn is talking to uh Aragorn about his age, I think is really valuable. Um, and how he's 87 years old and the soup joke was hilarious to me. And so like, I, I'd, I'd keep that humor in there, but also it just, it gives so much more depth to Aragorn's character. Cause that's something in the books. That's, that's big that he's a Duna Dian, you know, and he has that Numenorean history in him, whatever the case is. So he lives, he lives for longer. a longer life. Um, and I think that it just makes makes him even more impactful. I even said to you when we were watching it, uh, when Eowyn is like all emotional when he's gone, like she just talked to him like a couple that's hours a, before that's that. Not about, uh, no, uh, yeah. What's her name? The the blonde chick. It's Eowyn, right? Mm-mm. Eowyn's the elf, I think. Oh, it's Arwen. 
Okay. You were no brother than I. I, I'm, I could get the name wrong, so you could look it up to, to help me out. But uh, when when what's her face uh, is talk all emotional when he's gone missing, right? And he's Aowen. Aowen, yeah. Aowen, yeah. When he's gone missing and he fell off the cliff and he didn't come back, like she just talked to him like a couple hours ago about how he was 87 years old and how he's probably going to live like three lifespans. Like she's like, damn, and this just killed him? Like we must really be fucked, you know? And I yeah. think that's like a cool, cooler aspect than him, her not having that conversation and that scene happening. So it's just little stuff like that. But other than that, most of the scenes, I think what really hurt me is all the scenes with Treebeard. My God, dude! If if you have characters falling asleep to something being so boring on your screen, like it probably shouldn't be in a movie. You know yeah, what no, I mean? God, it, the the poetry. Yeah, it's like God. Was, this is bad. It was real bad. Uh, back on to the the scene with the steward and stuff. I I would have thought that that would have been better placed in the Fellowship film. Like that would have been kind of a cool scene. Yeah, uh, but and I think that's why they took it out of this this movie. Because, like I said, when we were watching it, it just kind of is already treading ground that doesn't really progress the story. So it makes sense they took it out. I think it would have been probably better if we saw it as some sort of a scene in Fellowship. But it, that's probably the way it was written in the books. So I, I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, yeah, what did you think about the... Um, the What was the deal with the water that was making Mary taller? <laughs> I don't know. But like that scene kills me, too. I'm just like, dude, I don't care doesn't do anything for me yeah that was just another boring scene that i'm glad they took it out and the the end poetry and then the ends have wives thing and they can't find right. they don't right the ends thing like just the whole end sequences was there was way too much yeah it was too much it was good to take them out uh yeah i'm trying to think i think that was pretty much all the extended cut type shit that I noticed, I guess. Well, there was a lot more Frodo, Sam, and... Oh, yeah, the first scene. Eagle. One of the first scenes. You, I think it's the first scene you the see. Rope. The rope. Yeah, that scene was dumb. Uh, Frodo couldn't see eight feet below him or lower. Mm -hmm. And then, like, falls, and Sam's like, save it! And it's like, when he drops something, it's some spices, and like yeah. let him, it was just... And there, I think there was also pacing, like the, the whole sequence of like um, Theoden uh, being poisoned, and then him coming out of it, and then figuring out his son died, and like the funeral sequence, like that whole funeral sequence, sequence isn't in the original cut, and I don't think it's needed. I think it just slows the plot down too much. It's like yeah. they really just jump from him finding out his son's dead uh, after he kicks out Grima and then um, he goes straight from having that conversation with the flower in his hand about how he, you know, no, no father should bury their sons. Like that's all you need. And I think that's why the theatrical cut does it so much for me in this specific movie, because this movie is so action packed and has so many crazy, massive plot points. And really, if you look at the, the pretty much the whole end sequence with the battle, there's only a couple little parts that are in there that are, extended cut versions and so that means that's pretty like much the same as the theatrical cut minus a couple little things and that just drags the whole first half three quarters of the movie on for so long because you just slam all this extended cut into that part no. um the, like the whole I, the one another one i don't like is like the trees moving i know it's in the book but like it's just too cheesy for me like the trees how they move and they like all the orcs like get killed by the trees remember that not what? the ants, the actual forest moves. At the end? Yeah, when, they, when they're running away from yeah. from uh, Rohan, you know, in Helm's Deep, and they, like, get eaten by the trees. Like, I'm like... Oh, that didn't bother me. I'm, I'm so checked out on that stuff. But at the same time, it's, like, not a big deal. But that was, like, the only part of the, the third half... The, I mean, the third act that was extended. Everything else was mostly in the original cut. And that's because it's so action-packed, and it's awesome, like... Give us all that, and we can kind of skip some of the boring stuff. But no, no, I I agree with what you're saying. Like the opening sequence with the rope thing, I feel like that they were just trying. Was they just trying to sh sh give a shout out to the Elvish rope that Galadriel gave to Sam? Like I appreciated that from the first extended cut. It's one of the items she gave to the travelers or the the fellowship, and then but it was just such stupid shit around yeah. them using that rope and just more like comedy <laughs> more comedy yeah 
uh, on the the tip with Legolas and Gimli keeping track of their kills, I would have thought they got forty three, right? Like that's their number. I would have thought they would have had higher numbers than forty three. I thought the same thing when they said it, and that's maybe why they cut it out because it's like they only got forty three. There was ten thousand Orakai, you know. Uh, it's like they only got a hundred. They I got one percent. <laughs> Not even. Yeah. You know what I mean? oh, is I, that point one point oh one percent? No, it's they didn't even get a hundred, it was eighty six together. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's what you mean. Yeah, it's one percent. Just under one percent. Is it? Of ten thousand? No. A hundred? A hundred? Yeah. It's one percent of ten thousand. Okay, right? Yeah. 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 So they got under one percent of the kills. Which yeah, I would have thought the they two biggest got- ballers in the whole place. Like you'd think they got more, dude. Yeah, I think you saw Legolas kill 43 on camera. So that's <laughs> why I was like, wait, you only have 43? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, the film itself, though, like the opening scene, so dope, with, <laughs> with Gandalf descending with the Balrog. And I think that scene still overall still holds up. I mean, some of the green screen and CGI naturally doesn't look flawless on 4K, but... It's pretty good. I mean, you can see some moments, and that, that's the entire film. There's a lot of CGI and stuff they were using back in 01, 02 that was limited, you mm-hmm. know? So that's okay. But I thought it still held up overall. Like, it's, you know, there were some fake rocks exposed throughout the, the, the film or just some bad green screens, but like, Overall, I liked it, and that first scene is dope. Yeah. I think 90% of the clips that didn't look good were cut in the from the extended. That's, that's like, really <clears throat> the most interesting part about it. It's almost like they could see into the future, and they were like, these aren't going to hold up very well. Like, there's one part where there are, uh, Gimli, Aragorn, and uh, Legolas are, like, walking in the woods right, right after they meet Gandalf. And there's that little scene where, like, Gimli's is going off about the forest or whatever. Yeah. There was one shot in there that was, like, awful. And I yeah. was like, oh, but that's not in the theatrical cut. Like, there's so many pieces uh, of that that, like, the jarring ones they actually took out, which is genius, you know? Um, but, the, yeah. The the woods and the Ents. There was a couple of oh, scenes with the Ents. And the Ents look cool sometimes. Sometimes they look super fake and puppety. And you could tell that they were making them on, like, a, a small scale type thing. Yeah. But yet again, good for the time. Just sometimes it took me out of it because I'm like, this is just so shitty looking. Mm-hmm. And uh, but that opening sequence, like you said, dude, I, it was one of the way the music drops in, and you just see Gandalf falling and fighting, and then the way that the the fire just starts lighting up that hole, and they like then you see them both falling through it, and and I still don't know if that was part of what really happened or, or a dream. dream yeah um because then you see him later fighting belrog on top of a mountain at the highest peak and in, in the lowest he made a statement uh, where he said he like fought with him at the depths all the way to the mountain so i feel like their fight took them from where frodo had seen him in the dream all the way to that i think he said the highest the the highest, the lowest mountain, it's the highest peak in the low. I don't know, something weird. I think it was like a peak that was in some other part of the universe. I don't know. I have, uh, honestly, I, I, I took it as like they were fighting for a really long time. Could have been. And they, it led to at the peak uh, of this mountain, and that's where he finished off the Balrog. The way he kills Balrog is tight as fuck, though. He's just like, I'm going to just like, like fucking Thor hammer my, my. Like Lance did. He was like, <laughs> like I'm just going to get lightning and fucking stab this motherfucker. Like, that shit's tight as fuck. I think it would have been cool if he cut his arms off in his head. Like, he did some like, gnarly shit, but it's okay. Nice, yeah. nice. On the tip of. The CGI and effects. Gone looks pretty good most of the time. There's a couple of times where it's like, all right, that looks like shit. But yet again, they're imposing this full CGI person onto a green screen, which is tough and ambitious. But overall, I thought Gollum as a whole looked good. And Andy Circus does such a good job. I mean, the, the <laughs> performance, especially for this really being the first time they do a mocap for like an entire movie for a main character, it, him, it, he just took that character to a whole nother level. And he hasn't just done it there. You know, he did it from with Caesar from the Planet of the Apes. Um, 
he does it here, and he has one other character too where he's full mocap. Uh, it was King Kong. Oh yeah, he was King Kong. So I just the fact that he's been able to do that on multiple occasions and do it at such a high level is fucking awesome. And yeah, Gollum is a wild character. He had to really get into some shit to get there and and be able to create that. Like there's some scenes when when he just turns and looks at somebody and goes, ah! <laughs> it's like, I love it, dude. Yeah, and I think honestly, this might sound crazy, but I think he should have been nominated for an Oscar. I agree. I don't, and I think because mocap is that the technology, right? The suits and stuff. I think at the time that it had come out, it was such new technology that people didn't realize it was a person that was actually acting. This character thought it was like voice like acting. a full CGI character, yeah. which wasn't the case. And I, I'm not saying he should have necessarily won the Oscar, but I think he definitely should have been nominated because it also was such cutting edge technology that he. I think changes the industry in a way because people saw this and were like, "Oh shit, you can have this character that assimilates with everything else in the film that we're making, and it's contributing positively." It's I mean, not, would Avatar exist without this? I mean, you could argue that it wouldn't. I don't think so. Like, I don't know, or it wouldn't have happened when it happened if this didn't happen when it did. You know, so yeah, he definitely revolutionized shit, and he did it at such a high level that's like people try to replicate what he's been able to accomplish, mm. and that's in just based off of this one performance. And obviously, this movie shines more light on that than any other one. I mean, he he has a role in the Return of the King. He has a role in the Fellowship, but this is really Gollum's movie. You know, I was I would argue that it. This one and Return of the King. Return of the King, he's in it almost more. Um, yeah, he's in it a good amount for sure. But yeah. I think he has more like speaking lines and like, you know, <clears throat> but he's definitely in both. But yeah, this is uh, a chance for him to really go out there and, and ball. And he did it. So Andy Serkis is a legend. Shout out to Andy Serkis. You already know the fuck. Andy Serkis. Hey, that and he's easily the funniest character in the franchise, which yeah. is nice. Yeah. Yeah. He's hilarious. Pippin's pretty funny too, but but Gollum just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The whole sequence of him talking to himself, I just I don't think anybody has like done that to that level where he's actually like flipping back and forth, having a conversation with himself, and it's working. Oh, the character itself with the mocap technology and just it's definitely unparalleled in a lot of ways. I'm sure I I don't have anything off the top of my head, but he is the OG of it yeah. for sure. And shout out to Peter Jackson for taking that on. I, that's a really, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's really ballsy. Risky. Yeah. Really ballsy to be like, we have to make this full CGI character and not going like cop out. It, he, if he did like a, some weird prosthetic suit for some skinny person and like had them yeah. act it all out, it could have not aged well at all. It would have been, been like, holy shit. And on the flip side, he could have done a whole CGI mocap character and it could have not aged well at yeah. all. Like he, took some shit on to be able to try to make that work and it worked so. yeah and i think what i noticed when i was watching this time too is i think in some scenes where they can afford to affect the color grading depending on the scenery to match his skin they do mm-hmm. like in the swamp scene it's very gray yeah and he blends in really well and also when they're in that outer city uh I, they do it a lot there where they do a lot of really strong gray color yeah. grading on it mm-hmm. which helps hide the outlining and the uh disrupt in, disruptance of the imposing of the character yeah. so i think they did the best they could with imposing this and did you know whether it was color grading or what have you but nonetheless did a good job yeah no i agree 100 percent. you could tell a lot of the effects that were scaled like there was one thing watching on your your TV really like exemplifies like bad CGI and bad green screen. I, I don't know why some TVs do and some TVs don't like my Sony uh, UHD doesn't do that. But my LG does sometimes and it's LED. So it has a little bit more of that. Like it's really a, it's glaring. usually depth. Yeah. yeah. If you're in my opinion, when TVs have slightly more depth to them. It'll expose those textures and yeah. those like. Uh, but all the whole ant fight with like uh, the flood and stuff, I was so wrapped up in the fact that like the water molecules looked too big because it was so close up because it was all like small scale mm-hmm. that they like built these sets 
so I just kept bugging me. And then also the Battle of Helm's Deep, when you see the explosion happen, like they blew up like a little small scale replica of Helm's Deep. And you could see like the particles of the dust and it's just too big. <laughs> it's like because yeah. they're just zoomed in on this small little, you know, yeah. thing. So little stuff like that just stood out to me. The green screen is pretty bad. Like a couple of times, like when they're in Frodo and Sam are standing there talking to Faramir, it's a little rough in the in that little cave. The green screen looks kind of crazy, but other than that, dude, it holds up pretty fucking good for two thousand what three or whatever. Yeah, two oh two two thousand two yeah, two thousand two. That's fucking crazy. Uh, no, it's it definitely holds up and it's definitely dope. And I'm not gonna be too overly critical on the film itself on some of these issues. You know what I mean? It's like. At the time, no one probably would notice it. And now it's, you know, when things get remastered and stuff, it hurts the overall look of the film. Mm-hmm. You know, like watch an 80s film, you'd be like, holy fuck, they're clearly on a set. You know what I mean? Right. So, and the ones that don't feel that way, you got to be like, where this is a really well done film because the set design and everything was really fucking on point. But yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. The this movie honestly it, it probably had an impact on changing my life. Um I don't think at any point in time in theatrical history were they able to build this kind of large scale battle um looking this good. It, it never happened before. Yeah, we talked about the how they. Yeah, when we talked about the fellowship, we had that. We talked a lot about the battle at the beginning of that movie, but this that Helm's Deep sequence, I don't. I think it could still stand up as one of the best theatrical wars battles of all time. I mean, you could put it up against a lot of different scenes and a lot of different movies, and I don't know how many would compete or be better. It's, I would give it top ten. I would give it top three. I mean, yeah. I mean, I just don't know. I had to like you. You you look at all the biggest ones. I mean, Star Wars has some pretty epic space battles, but like hand like hand to hand combat arrows and stuff. Like I was, I even mentioned like the long night in Game of Thrones is fucking trash compared to this shit. Like not even on the same fucking realm. Uh, you have some other Game of Thrones battles that are pretty cool, but nothing that's on this scale. The the way that Gandalf comes in and you know, do sex machia machina this shit you know like, uh, I it's it's probably the best example of that and best like well most well done version of that in cinema in my perspective I, I just think that there's really no flaw when it comes to how the sequence happens I don't think there's as menacing of a force than the Urukai like the way they look on screen is absolutely the most scary, menacing thing I could possibly imagine. Like, if you had to fight the uruk in real life, you can't tell me you wouldn't be shitting yourself. Yeah, no, they, <laughs> they're they super gnarly looking. They look gross. Like, yeah. truly, like, gross. It's like, almost, like, gross. monstrous, you know? Like, they have, like, a monster thing going on, but they're also, like, human-ish. Yeah. They did a cool job just from even the birthing of them. I think they stole that clip from the first movie, right? The birthing of the Orakai. I think they used an additional clip, but yeah, same. Well, the, it comes out in the slime, mm-hmm. the like embryo of sorts. And then, yeah, the makeup for them are super great. And they look fucking gross. Like, I wouldn't want to eat and look at them. You know what I mean? And I, I pretty much I can eat and watch whatever. But, like, they're kind of gross, you know? And uh, and they just I, casted like a bunch of massive men to like just like huge, paint dude. black and like fucking make their teeth all like how did they I don't know how they made them look that real and it's so fucking crazy because if they did this same sequence in 2023 all of them would be CGI it would be whack and it would and be that's awful. why the Hobbit isn't yeah that's why the Hobbit's not as good exactly because but the fact that they literally got like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of real people yeah. painted them all black and had all these crazy designs and facial stuff and 
and they've casted a bunch of massive men. I don't know if you noticed, but like when they're screaming, you can see they did like whole dental implant. Like, yeah, like their molars were fucked up looking. I was like, oh shit, they did the crazy, whole enchilada. It's just cool. Yeah, shit is crazy, bro. I I honestly don't <sighs> think it could have been done. And there was a lot of cool battles in this. Like the end battle was fucking awesome. I remember, especially <clears throat> as a kid, like I, that was probably my favorite part was the ends coming down. Like fucking up like Saruman's whole thing like when when Treebeard busts out the woods and gets all like butthurt about the fact that you know Saruman's people and orcs cut all the trees down I was just like let's fucking go <laughs> <laughs> and then on top of that like the battle with the wargs with the war riders yeah that's sick bro I, I said it during the movie I was like this is the sickest shit that's ever happened in the history of fucking cinema oh here we go <laughs> but like when Legolas just snipes two of them and then like one hand flies up onto the, the horse with Gimli like swag the fuck that's out a, Legolas is the most swag character and Aragorn he's fucking dope yeah, yeah. no Aragorn like, is just and Gimli all of them those yeah. that three is like so so g'd out it's fucking crazy and it's so fun to watch them and this this movie like started movie memes i don't care what anyone says like movie memes didn't exist because there wasn't like memes but this like had like youtube videos of like they're taking the hobbits to eyes and god oh yeah, yeah and yeah, like yeah, yeah. boil them mash them stick them in a stew like that shit didn't exist i swear like yeah it's crazy <laughs> yo back on the Urukai, right I love how they sound and act too, bro. And yeah, just the practical effects on those are fucking super good. Looks like meat smack on the menu, boy. <laughs> I so couldn't even good. fucking do it if I tried, bro. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that, I agree though. Everything about the way the Orakai are built, and I like the whole, um, you know, or really, this movie distinguishes the difference between Orakai and Orcs a little bit more, which is cool. You kind of see that orc are larger and they are, you know, more brutish. Um, where orcs are more like weaselly, you know. It's, I thought they look more like goblins. Goblins and orcs are the same. Um, they are. Mm-hmm. But like the movies have kind of made them look like they're different, but they're interchangeable in the books. So I don't know. Okay. So, question: Saruman recruited some homeless looking tribe that's the wildsman yeah yeah in the extended cut they sh they show him there's some humans that lived near him or something that he recruited uh, it, the rohirrim kind of pushed them out of their uh territory their territory and like exiled them to like the mountains that's what he says and so he's like go get your land back and they're like okay. so they want <laughs> that's who was like kind of storming storming through the outskirts of okay. Rohan. Yeah. And then do we think that Arag Aragorn or Aragorn? Aragorn. Aragorn? Oh. Okay. Aragorn tracked the hobbits a little too quick. I know he's some super tracker. He is just like, oh, they're, oh, they, 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 they crawled here. Oh, here's the rope. They, it just was, I know in movies they got to move it along, but I just was like, Jesus Christ. Little, I think everything was grand until he stood up and started being like, and they walked over here. And they walked over like, dude, how do you see those footsteps so easy, bro? He's so, I was like, come <laughs> but on. But until that point when he's like, they laid here. And then he like kind of walks a little bit. And then they're like, the, they, oh, they, they're, they were bound. And then he's like, they, their browns were cut. And then like, he stands up and then he's like, then they walked over here. Then they walked over here. Then they were <laughs> yeah, in the woods. You're like, what the fuck? Uh, I, I can laugh at that kind of shit because the movie is good or whatever. But yeah, it just makes me laugh because. Yeah. Did you know he broke his foot when he kicked that helmet? <laughs> oh my god, that's a funny joke because anybody that is, follows Lord of the Rings shit, it's like <laughs> every Lord of the Rings person while watching that scene makes that comment. It's yeah, fucking hilarious. Uh, one thing that I watch when I and I feel when I watch this about Frodo is I just get annoyed because he's so naive and he constantly needs saving, saving like all the time. From Gollum or Sam or whoever. It's just like, he's so stupid. Like, Frodo sucks. So, we talked a little bit about this last time. But I, I, I need know. to I need to help here. I know the This ring. is a very common feeling towards Frodo. Especially in this movie and the next movie. But what, what people need to understand is that as time goes on, the ring has more bearing 
over his well-being and it continuously tries to destroy their quest actively it's actively trying to make frodo naive or frodo make the wrong move or frodo fall into the water or frodo get caught or you know what i'm saying it's actively doing that to him and it's also tearing him down as a person during that time period as well so he's he's also getting destroyed and his self is being ruined i mean if you look at gollum gollum was just any other hobbit when he first found the ring and that's what he the ring turned him into and the 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 long longer you're and that's why frodo looks at gollum and has this feeling of empathy towards him and he has these moments where he's like i i I feel for him and i i need to see that he can come back and that's why he snaps at sam because he's seeing himself in gollum and he's seeing that happening to him and if you look at gollum you would say gollum's naive and stupid and and makes bad decisions you know what i mean and that's because he's the the essence of what the ring does to somebody and so the ring is in control and not that but the ring is 10 times more powerful now than it was when Gollum had it because the closer it gets to sauron's hands the more powerful it gets his eye yeah but i mean his hands um so like there's so many factors of it frodo is being literally torn into pieces right now by the most powerful thing on the planet and he's just battling on a day-to-day basis. And that's just a brutal war of, of might. And he's, he's winning it, to be honest. Even though he's almost losing, he's winning it. Yeah, it's, it's just something to watch. I'm just like, oh, God, it's so fucking much. It's, yeah. like, it's almost like watching a damsel in distress yeah. constantly. And it's like, Jesus Christ, dude, pull it together. Yeah, and, and I wish the movie did more to kind of exemplify that in my perspective. Because I feel like that's one of the main criticisms that people have about uh, this movie in particular is just that Frodo is always seeming like he's incapable or he's weak or he's, you know what I mean? When really he's one of the strongest characters in the entire movie. He's Nobody else had to battle the ring. Look at what it did to Boromir. Boromir never even fucking touched it. You know what I mean? And he was a war hero. We just saw that. One of the strongest guys probably in all of Middle Earth men and he got tore apart by it without even touching it and this dude frodo is carrying it for you know months on end you know what i mean it's crazy yeah i uh that's fair like i knew you're gonna say that <laughs> <laughs> of course you know? but i, I just, gotta defend my boy frodo you already know what the fuck going on <laughs> but he just is fucking annoying i don't like frodo as a character yeah i get it i get it, it he He's the unexpecting hobbit. It's like how you feel with the kids shit in Potter watching the early ones where like I see through it because I'm like, it's fine. They become dope. And you're like, it's Frodo. It's, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, but there's more of an in, in-universe reason as to why he acts the way he does. And that's because he's literally holding the most powerful thing on the planet. That's tearing him apart. Like That's an in-universe reason for him acting like okay. a fucking fool, you know? Okay. Why can there be two white wizards? So there isn't. I think Saruman gave up his white wizardry when he turned over to, okay. uh, you know, the dark side. Fair enough. <laughs> Raider. Yeah. And Gandalf has no recollection of being Gandalf, Gandalf the Grey? This is one thing about the movie that really pisses me off. It always has pissed me off. Is there is no way that when Merry and Pippin see Gandalf, they don't say, Gandalf? He acts like the first time he heard somebody call him Gandalf is when Aragorn says it. He's like, yeah, that's that's what True. they called me. That shit pisses me off every time. I don't know if they flip, if they did something wrong there, but like, there is no they way Merry and Pippin didn't say Gandalf. Gandalf. Yeah, instantly. But there could have been just he was still coming to terms with who he was. I don't know. I don't know why I'm defending it, but I don't know. Yeah, that shit frustrates me every time I see it. I'm like, there's shit like that in movies, and like when there's just a lot of literature, just like there's so much in films, and they're cranking these out. It's sometimes you just gotta be like, they they just fill in the blank for them, like help them out. They do so much right that you just gotta be like, dude, (laughs) it's fine. No, yeah, it's true. It just always bothered me. I was always just like, why is this the first time he's hearing Gandalf? He just saw Marion Pippin. There's no way they didn't say his name. Yeah, because I was like, is is Gandalf the White a different person? Because he was acting like he kind of was. No, he said that each day was like a hundred years of Earth or a thousand years of Earth or whatever. Um, something along those lines. He said so, that he lived like six lifetimes 
of Gandalf the Grey. That's what he says. Okay. Six l- lifetimes of the Earth is what he said specifically. So I, I don't know if that means Earth time, like lifetime of the Earth, right? Like literally from start to finish, or if his he, own lifetimes or whatever. I don't know, but it was a very long time that he was n- gone, and so I think what really happened was because of how much time he spent away from real from the world we know it. He just forgot a lot of things. Like it was just so he's so separate separated from when we saw him last. Think about if you lived a thousand years. If if all of a sudden Jordan ceased to exist and then you lived a thousand years and then you came back and I was like, "Yo, Jordan," you'd be like, "The fuck is that, Jordan?" You'd be like, "Because Holy when he fuck. went Gandalf the White, he, he lived other." I'm confused. That transition from when he passed out on that mountaintop to when he came back was to him, from what I understood, roughly thousands of years. Oh, I didn't perceive it to be that. Exactly. So like that and so because of that, when he came back, it had been he had been so far long removed from his life as Gandalf because he became this uh, other the white wizard. The, the entity. And he is this entity that was sent down from like the gods of Middle Earth um yeah, to yeah, protect yeah. Middle Earth and so, you know, when he when he fought the Belrog and he got taken, they probably did some shit with him. But he lived like thousands and thousands of years in a time period between him dying and then coming back, you know? I'll trust you for what you're saying is mm-hmm. to be true. Did could it, I think we talked about this on the last episode, but I'm not sure. But with Gandalf just hitting up the Eagles and how <laughs> these are like one of those plot holes that like oh, you fools. You could just get the Eagles to do, just drop the ring over Mordor and like it'd be a wrap. Like that would just save. I think the easiest way to look at it is first of all, the Eagles are similar beings to what Gandalf is. Like they are this higher level entity in Middle Earth. Um, and because of that, they're not really interested in the quarrels of. But still, Mordor and but still. humans, like they don't give a shit. So, but still, and not only that, but they don't, they don't, they don't do what Gandalf says. They're just Gandalf's friend, and like they'll help him out if they want. But in the books, it goes into a lot more detail about how much they just don't give a fuck and how they'll do whatever the fuck they want to do. I'd be curious to read that excerpt just yeah. to like give background. I, and I know how that shit goes. Like with Potter, there's things in the latter end of the books where you could be watching the films and be like, well, why is this? And it explains it in the book. And you're like, that's why it seems a little plot holy watching the film, but it's not really the the movie looks like the Eagles are just like at any given call from Gandalf and that they're not really smart. They're just like these creatures, but they are like the smartest, one of the smartest creatures in middle earth. And they kind of do their own thing and they don't listen to anybody. They don't do, they don't follow any rules. They're like yeah. off doing their own fucking shit. So a lot of that, uh, fucking they, Eagles. cause there was that whole story that there's that whole theory that when Gandalf fell, he said, fly you fools. And the whole theory was that he was telling them to get on the Eagles and fly the rest of the way. And like, that was his whole plan to begin with based off of where he was going. He was going to get on the Eagles and fly, but because he fell, he couldn't call the Eagles, but like it's pretty much debunked from like the actual literature because of the way the Eagles are and how they wouldn't have ever yeah. helped and done something like that, right? Fair enough. I hate in movies when they don't kill a big piece of shit when the person should definitely be killed. In this film, what's his name? Grima Worm Tongue. The yeah, Worm Tongue. Yeah. The king of Rohan after he comes to, which by the way, the effects when they change from him zombie to human was really good. Yeah, it looks great. But he's after he comes to, he tries to kill Worm Tongue or whatever, and Aragorn, Aragorn tr- stops him and he's like, Enough blood has been spilled Spilled on his behalf. Yeah, but then I mean, come on, this dude is a piece of shit, like for real, for real. Yeah, and he just goes to Saruman and. Rats. If it so, wasn't for him, they probably wouldn't. Ha- he wouldn't have known to blow up Helm's Deep. He probably wouldn't yeah. have even known they were going to Helm's Deep as early as they did. Like he really fucked up a lot of shit. And I don't know what the book talks about when it comes to that. But I don't know why Aragorn left. Let him live. I have no. I idea. hate it stuff make like sense. that. I, the self righteousness gets the best of characters. I know it helps move plots and stuff, but I don't like 
when that's the case, because it's just it. It almost seems too unrealistic to me. Where I'm like, right. you would murk that motherfucker. That, that dude sucks. Yeah, and you know what? It's funny when I was watching it this time, I really realized how easy it would have been for Grima to get underneath Theoden's like skin and and do that. I mean, imagine if you knew the White Wizard was sending an emissary. Uh, to come and talk to you and help you with your the things you need help with, you trust Saruman and you trust whoever he sent, right? So like it's so I could see how easily he would have corrupted him. And I, no, that's fair. It's just like, it, but then afterwards, I have no idea why yeah. everyone stopped him from killing him. It's like dude, just fucking slaughter that dude. Yeah, like, because there's the risk. Cut him that down, he, dude. Yeah, he's gonna f- hurt more people yeah. naturally because he's a piece of shit. So I agree. So. Can non elves go to is it the promised land? What do you call the elf? The uh, the um, the it's uh, the, the the undying lands. Positive, I'm like 90 percent undying lands. Oh, um, so n- no, it is an elven realm, Valinor, undying lands, mm-hmm. undying lands, yeah. yeah. Um, it is an elven realm, but at the end, uh, Bilbo and spoiler alert, <laughs> at the end, Bilbo and Frodo go to Undying. Yeah, yeah, so, so like, that's... I'm sure that other people in Gandalf goes too. Does he go? Yes, he does. I'm pretty sure. Um, he might, yeah. So like, yeah, I'm pretty sure other people can go, but I don't know whether like they die right before they get there or like what. I don't know. But from what I saw and what it looked like, it looks like they can go over there and chill. So if you were Aragorn. Wouldn't you just go out with your lady and go there? That's what I would do. Um, I don't think that you become eternal. I think that it's undying for elves because the elves are eternal. And it's a place for them to find peace and get away from the problems of Middle Earth. But it's not a place for a human to go and be eternal there. Wouldn't you still go, though? I don't don't know. I mean... I would. I'm like, fuck this. I don't want to go kill these Arakai. Yeah, but Ar- without Aragorn, they would have lost the battle and Middle Earth would have been lost. He's the reason He's the this reason. all happens. I mean, think about it. Without I'm, selfish. Him out. Him I'm out. selfish. I'm selfish. I'm out. sorry. But we did do a breakdown on the channel of how uh, Pippin is the most pivotal, most important character in Lord of the Rings and has the most yeah. impact. And you can go check that out right now. You already know what the fuck. Oh, one up, one up TV. <laughs> check it out. Hot take section. <laughs> so yeah, that was a that was a good breakdown we did. Fun fact. You want to hear a fun fact? Absolutely. Sean Connery was allegedly offered thirty million per film plus fifteen percent of box office, which would have been roughly four hundred fifty million to be Gandalf. Really, yeah. Sean Connery. Who he's savage. Sean I, Connery. Can you tell me like what he's in so I know? Um, he was in the Indiana Jones one, the third one. You don't know Sean Connery? He was like the first James Bond. James Bond. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, wow, that's wild. They want him to be Gandalf. Uh, they offered him a fuck. Ian away. McKellen killed it. So no, for sure. Sean Connery was done acting. At that point, if I'm not mistaken, his last film that he did was League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, hmm. which I wanted to review that film. I actually did a review and never put it out. Um, what? Oh, it came I out. just wanted to see what Sean Connery looks like. This is not a good picture of him. That's like him super old. Hold on. Yeah, I mean, I could see him playing Gandalf, but I think that uh, Ian McClellan, I don't think there anybody else should have been Gandalf. Ian McClellan is like the, the GOAT. Yeah, no, he killed it for sure. Hold on. Sean Absolute Connery. Works. This dude. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he looks like he would have been better at Saruman. Yeah, he could have crushed it. But, yeah, I just thought it was interesting because it's just That's not. a lot of money, dude. Holy shit. And you, fun fact, you just told me when we were watching it, is that uh, um, Orlando, Bloom. Orlando Bloom only got paid 175 k for all three. 350 to do the trilogy. Oh, 300. Allegedly. He said it in a uh, Howard Stern interview not too long ago. That's fucking wild. If he didn't get royalties on that shit, he's... I don't think yeah, he did because he was like a nobody when he fucking did these films. And I mean, it he set came his career back, off, so... But they had him come back for The Hobbit, so... Yeah, he probably got paid. Oh, my God. <laughs> They're like, we need you. He's like, all right, pay me fucking 10 mil to make up for it, dog. <laughs> yeah, right. Mmm... 21 mil. 
Yeah. Never Alleg- mind. 21 mil. <laughs> Allegedly. That's pretty good. 7 million in film. Yeah. I don't think he was in all of them. The Hobbits? I don't think he was in all of them. I think he was just in the second He's and third one. lightly in, I think, all of them. Like, yeah, he maybe might. He is in the first one. I don't remember, dude, to be honest. Like, he I only does. watch those movies like twice each time. Same. Yeah, and Benedict Cumberbatch is schmog. Schmog. Smog. Yeah, Benedict Cumberbatch killed that shit. Uh. That's shit crazy. Do you know how another fun fact, and I started this also like on my feed one time, was that they made the sound from the Saruman's army from a crowd of like 20,000 fans of cricket. Oh, yeah, you told me that. I think I sent you the video because I was like, this is fucking gnarly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Uh, that's so why he went, sound- the, he went in the crowd and just like recorded a whole like fan base of cricket in a stadium to yeah. like make sounds for the movie. That's so fucking tight. Yeah, in between like innings or whatever for cricket or something like that. But Dude, that that army. So that, that says a lot about cricket. Hell yeah. And the fans of cricket. <laughs> <laughs> Turn up. No, that army of Orkai walking and like it's it's just I I said when Aragorn came up over the hill and he was all fucked up on the horse I would, I would, the, the look on his face was like oh fuck and then he like ran in the other direction like I would have done the same shit yo that shit was fucking crazy it, like I I don't think 10,000 of those things like you could put the US military up against it and it would probably still be pretty uh pretty pretty gruesome you know they they definitely hold it down I don't know. I thought it was funny. They tried to get the children to fight at Helm's D. Like the 10 year olds. I was like, what the fuck are these 10 year olds going to do? God, like, do give, them a, do. give them a bow or something. Yeah. Don't give them like a sword. What the fuck are they going to do with that? You're just sending these kids out to slaughter. So in the books, the elves don't come and show up. Oh, for real? Uh, at Helm's Deep. Yeah, that's something that was just added for the movies. But I think it was phenomenal. I think it's a phenomenal. Why do you edition. think they added it? Um,. I think that it just uh, probably it, first of all it made the battle more realistic because if they didn't show up like they would have been really really fucked you know what I mean like the amount of men they had and like the situation they were in I just felt like it was so much more less likely you would have ended that sequence and been like there's no way they would even last that long you know but with the elves there you're like oh they got a pretty like formidable force now against the orc like they're gonna hold their their own for long enough to be able to get the help um, from the Rohirrim at the end and Gandalf uh, so I think that's one part of it. Um, but I think the other part of it is just like how Deer had a pretty cool role and he was like a fan favorite from the first movie. Um, so bringing him back to like come and be a hero, I think was something that they wanted to do just from like his, I don't know, his impact or potential thought of impact because they kind of filmed all these at the same time, right? So maybe it was just like the the fact that they felt like he did a good job at his, his small role in the first movie. Or like we should just make it a bigger role in the second, but I don't know. I thought it was cool. I like that. It's one of my favorite aspects of this movie is when the elves show up. I'm like, oh, that's tight because, as we know, in the first battle, elves and men fought together. You know, thousands of years before or whatever. It seemed like it would have been in the book. Yeah, but it wasn't. Huh. So do in Middle Earth enough compasses? Why well, do you say that? Because I just think at points it's funny that they need Gollum because. They have to go to. I know the journey is basically like, I think it's like Florida to fucking like the Great Lakes or Washington State or something. Like it's pretty far. Yeah. It's not like across the state or something. So I know they need some sort of guidance to some degree, but they get so far without Gollum. And then pretty much when Mordor is in sight is when they need Gollum. But it's how do you not follow the red sky with the volcano? I just well, there's a couple parts when they're in those like uh, the the misty like uh, foggy mountain things, right? Visibility is really bad, so they'll get up on top and they'll see it, and they'll be like, "Okay, that's the way we got to go." And then they'll go down back to where the visibility is awful and get turned around four times and then pop up in the same spot. So they don't you don't you don't really see that, but like that's the reason why they were so lost in there. So um, they don't have compasses. Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> okay. They have maps. You see the maps. So I just thought they would have a compass. Yeah, that's interesting. No, uh, I mean maybe there's no po- poles in Middle Earth, you know? And there's no magnetic anything. It's the middle. Yeah, maybe it's not that. I, I Is there compasses in Middle Earth? Tell us. Please answer this. Um 
One thing I do love though is I love when they're Faramir was looking at the map and pretty much getting explained to how you know Saruman is attacking Rohan from Helms at Helms Deep and Mordor is here with us Gilead here and you know the Gondor and just the fact that like they're pretty much getting squeezed by both forces and they're going to men men they're getting attacked by on both sides and then you kind of exemplify when um the beginning of Helm's Deep when Theoden is like, who's going to come help us? The elves? Like, the dwarves? Like, and then, you know, Aragorn's like, Gondor. And he's like, goes on this list of all the times Gondor hasn't been been around for him. And he's, yeah. you can see he's like distraught about yeah. it. Um, I think that like really exemplifies the state of Middle Earth at this point in history where it's like the elves are just pretty much all gone. They're like, fuck this place. And <laughs> they're like, we're, we're dipping. <laughs> The dwarves have pretty much destroyed themselves and been destroyed, right? By getting, you know, kind of ejected from all their homes or getting killed by uh, goblins and orcs or whatever the case is. Um, and they're off doing their own fucking thing. They don't give a fuck. But like, there's no kind of connectivity between any of these people anymore. And it's made them so weak that it's made it that much easier for Sauron and Saruman to, to come and take advantage of this moment, you know, in, in, in the history. And that's, I think the weakness of Gondor and the weakness of Rohan and the weakness of men in general just had created this pocket of time where the darkest parts of the world could rise up kind of underneath everybody's nose without anybody noticing. It's really interesting. That's fair. Mm -hmm. Who's your favorite character in this film? So my whole childhood, my favorite character was Gimli. And... Um, I think I asked you this question in the first one, but there is new characters. I don't know if. Yeah, no, I th- I think it was Gimli in this movie specifically, but now in my adult years, I think it's got to be uh, Legolas. Yeah, he's tight. But Aragorn's just obviously, I mean, I, he's the easy pick. Aragorn's a fucking G. Obviously, we all know uh, he opened the door cooler than anybody's ever opened the door in the history of time. Um, coolest door opening sequence in all of theatrical history. Um, Disagree. (laughs) That is cool. Uh, But Legolas just is, is such a fucking dope character. His His little one liners. His one liners hold it down. Surprise. I hate one liners in movies, but they're so weirdly good in this movie and bad. They're like bad, but you're just like, where he just turns like, the sky's red. Blood has been spilled this night. Then just like keeps rolling. They're like, yes. Love it. He has many one-liners. Yeah. Do you know any more from this movie? Yeah. He's like, uh, Aragorn's like, what do your elf eyes see? He's like, they're taking the hobbits to Isengard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But he does, has a bunch in the woods too. Like I forgot him specifically, but he's, yeah, he's woods one-liners. Are the woods are talking. Or something. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know the movie. Well. Oh yeah. He's, he's pretty good when he's like, there's something out there. And he's like, the white wizard. <laughs> You're like, oh, shit. Yeah. Dude, he's so good. It's great. Is Wait. there a character you fucking don't like in this movie? Um, let's see. I don't like Eowyn. I don't either. God, she's annoying. She's so homely. Go home, bitch. And it's just, it's just like, dude, like you really are so obsessed with this man. And he doesn't give two fucks about you. Like, he does not care. I'm sorry. He doesn't give a fuck. Think about that eternal pussy, though. Like, the, the, um, what's her name? The. Arwen. Arwen. Like, think about a woman that doesn't age, what that's like, compared to this homely bitch. That's not, she dirty. You got nothing. (laughs) And she can't cook. And it's like she, kn- <laughs> like, yeah, she can't cook her shit. <laughs> get the fuck out of here, bitch. Like. But you know what's so fucking funny is like she really has a thing for him. Yeah. Like you'd think she would have just re- figured it out and been like, okay, I, I got no chances. But um, she you know doesn't. Be. My sleeper, though, and I always fuck his name up, so you might need to help me. Who's the leader of the, the Rohirrim that rocks with Gandalf at the end, pulls up? His name is. um. I don't know, but he's cool. You don't, like him? you don't like him? You don't like him? No, I fuck with him. He's my sleeper pick. Oh, you just sleeper pick. I think it's a, something Drid. Um, I can't. I don't even know what to look up. Just look up the cast. You'll see him. He's okay. pretty high up there, I'm sure. Theodrid? I think it's Theodrid. He's Theodrid. cool, though. He. I like him as an actor. He's always holding out. Omer? 
He's Carl Carl Urban, but Aimer. Oh, Aomir. Yeah, Aomir. Aomir. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I don't speak Aomir. Lord of the Rings swag. <laughs> yeah, Aomir. Yeah, I always fuck his name. I'm sorry. Uh, but Aomir is a fucking G, dude. Yeah, he's and the way he man. like just like literally threatens Gimli the first time he sees him, he's like, "I'd cut your head off." If you stood a little bit taller on the ground. Swag, like swag. And then fucking Legolas is like, uh, he says, he says something like, "You would die before, like your sword." Like, yeah, he says some swag shit. But he like fucking puts his bow and arrow in his face. I thought there was. In the extended cut of this film, Saruman's death. Is that in Return of the King? Return of the King. I want to see Return of the King. I want to see that because I was waiting for that all movie. I was like, mm-hmm. oh, because he like jumps from the tower or something. Right, because you don't see that in the theatrical. Yeah. I think that the from what I remember, the extended version of Return of the King almost makes that movie better. I think this is literally the only movie out of the three that the extended version makes it a lot worse. Yeah. So it's a lot less of a pleasurable experience to watch that movie than it would be to watch the theatrical cut. Because what I just did is I went on a marathon and watched this with uh, my daughter, who's 16. She had seen these when she was young, but she always said I didn't like them. A lot of it was like the Frodo stuff and like the boring da 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 We watched the theatrical versions all through, and this was a couple months ago. Uh, and she loved it. She was fucking all in, and she had a great time. And I had a great time. So it's cool to be able to see just those, those fairly recently, and then watch these ones with you, um, and then kind of be able to compare and contrast. I think it's 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 cool. But yeah, the the theatrical version of the Two Towers is undeniably way better. Yeah, and I'm trying not to hold my rating against against it with the, with the extended cut because it was a completely different watch like the extended cut from the uh, fellowship was actually enjoyable it was like oh this little new scene because it's only like 20 it's 30 minutes longer or 20 minutes longer it's not tremendously longer right. uh it might even be only 20 minutes i can't remember anyways this is fucking a full hour and yeah 50 minutes of it is fucking bullshit yeah and and i think that but i do also want to give credit to Peter Jackson in the editing room for figuring out discretion. Yeah, they really did a good job. They they picked the best cut that they could possibly pick from all the clips that they had gotten and mm. they and they made the best movie possible from what they did. A lot of times you see like extended versions you're like, "Damn, like this should have been in the movie and all this shit shouldn't have been." But right. that's not the case here. There's some clips that we talked about that would have made the movie a little cooler if you added them, but they didn't have to be there. But like, yeah. there was nothing from the extended version that was like, why did they have this in the extended and not in the actual cut? Right. No, like keep the actual theatrical cut the way it is, and it's perfect. You know what I mean? So they got to give a lot of credit where credit's due. Yeah. Is there other things you want to talk about this film? Um, I do. Yeah. So there's a couple of things. First of all, I want to talk about how the evolution of the ring wraiths. Uh, is tight how they're just flying around in fucking dragons like they're like the nazgul is just like yeah like like worm dragons long neck dragons this honestly first time i saw it i was like bro the nazgul are so fucking scary it's like they're the sickest dude and they're so like ah dude they and there's cool aspects to it like when he's uh, when frodo's on the bridge and he's like about to put the ring on because it's like, you know, the Nazgul's like calling for it, you know? And then you just see it like fly up all of a sudden. You're like, oh, fuck. Yeah, you get a good look at it. That yeah. shit is sick as fuck. And the Nazgul are just like probably the coolest, scary like uh, things. And I, I talked a little bit about how they're not that menacing in the first one. Uh, like when they're on Weathertop, how it's just like, dude, how do they not just kill the, the hobbits? They're supposed to be like these badass creatures, uh, half dead, half alive, whatever. Um, but in this movie, I feel the menacing is is there a little bit more. It's like, dude, they're, they're pretty fucking bad. It's like people are really shook when they come around and they're like causing some damage, you know? I'm um, surprised the Return of King is on a better film because they really just bring all the coolest parts essentially in a film, but it just doesn't execute well. It's weird because like the Nazgul are up in there. There's huge battles. Yeah. All the characters are like fully developed. It's every all the stories come to fruition. They're getting to Mordor. It's well, I think the I think that the Return of the King would have been way better had they not taken that creative liberty from something that wasn't in the books, and that's the ghosts coming in at the end of the fight. And we'll talk more about it when we get there. But um, in this scenario where they did the creative liberty of adding in the elves at Helm's Deep, I think was a good one. Um, but I think in that scenario, it really did some hindrance on the story just because I thought we looked up 
whether the ghosts were in or not, and they are. They are, but they don't help in the final battle. They they help win like a side battle to win the boats over or whatever, and then they go home. So they're in it, but they just don't like come and take over the final battle the way they did in the Return of the King. Yeah. And so like I think that takes away a lot from what could it could have been, um, just based off that creative liberty. So I I do believe that this movie did a better job at keeping the battles large scale right extremely large scale but more grounded in the sense of like real they felt fucking real and i think that's what made this so fucking amazing um and hold hold it down for so long because it's like damn like it, it's just so grand but also feels like you could have been standing right there um with them so yeah i i, I don't know it's 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 hard but something else i want to say did you want to say anything else about that no, you're good. Um, you're good. Something else I want to say is the Two Towers video game. Gas. Dude, so fucking gas. We, the people, <laughs> yeah. need a remake of the Two Towers Lord of the Rings video game <laughs> and, and make it so you can do four player. Because you go four player co op if you were, if you had four controllers and shit, or it was just two? I think it was just two. Yeah, I think I don't even. Could you co op it? I thought it was a yeah. solo game. No, it was couch co op. Oh, it was couch co op. So we, we yeah. need Lord of the Rings Two Towers game remade Quad remaster play online yeah. that should be fucking awesome yes. yeah yeah it, it would have been really fucking amazing and it's funny because there i don't think there's ever been another video game that i've personally played so tell me if i'm wrong but that i've personally played that's been adapted from a movie so well um when it comes to like following along the story of the movie mm. with the characters that are actually from that movie and like going along with each scene and like what actually happened and playing it, it was just so tight, dude. I, I, it, it, it almost like added so much more depth to the actual movie itself that game did, and that's really cool. And that, not that's I don't think that's happened many times, and if it has, I haven't played it. I'm trying to think, like mm. because like a lot of like even the, like the Harry Potter game that you're playing or you played is it's not, really good, but it has nothing to do with the storyline yeah, yeah, of the yeah. movies. Yeah, you know? Howard's Legacy is swag. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm looking at these games where I don't think so. And I'm trying to think of like some old school shits. <sighs> like obviously like Kingdom Hearts has parts of movies, yeah, but, but you're nothing, not playing a character no, from that movie. Nothing yeah. that's like yeah. titled the movie, the, whatever the movie right. I'm trying to think. Like, it's so dope, dude. And it follows like all the biggest plot points, all the biggest battle points. And like your... It expands on it. Yeah, it does. It's so <laughs> fucking tight, dude. It's It's honestly... And it wasn't easy either. It was a pretty difficult game to do well. And there were so many aspects of how you could do things better. Because remember, like, it, the more, like, perfect kills you got, like, the higher mm. rating you got and shit. And that was so fucking hard to get perfect kills over and over again. And then if you got good enough at it, you were. But then you, like, fuck up one kill. And it would fuck up your whole rating for the whole fucking, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Shit was you crazy. Could, like, new skills and shit like that, which is tight. Yeah, and you could pick who you wanted to, like, boost. So, like, if you didn't play with Aragorn at all, he would suck by the end of yeah. it. Like, yeah. You would only have Legolas be dope or whatever. Like, it was really fucking dope, dude. Okay. That video game was tight. And I, uh, still, I still have it for PS2. And I've played it a couple of times. I was actually thinking about putting it in my studio with a PS2 hooking it up to the TV. Just, like, fuck around you and should. play with that shit. Yeah, when I'm, like, chilling and someone's, like, you know, making a song and just, like, over here fucking rocking Lord, Lord of the Rings, Two Towers. That's yeah. why. Because Two Towers game had, uh, it was all the Fellowship of the Ring and Two Towers in it. But then they made a Return of the King game that I played a couple of times and I really didn't like. But it I don't was, think that was that bad either, though. Like, I think it was good. Yeah. I don't think it was as good as the Two Towers. But. No. But I, the Two Towers was cool because he really had the whole Fellowship of the Ring and the whole um, Two Towers movie. So it was both combined, which is really fucking dope. It was really, really cool. It was really great for the fucking time. Um, oh, for sure. Other thing I want to mention is, like, this watching this again just helps remind me how bad the Rings of Power uh, show is. And I know you haven't watched it. Um, but fuck, dude, it's what, fuck? it's so fucking bad. See, I've man. one of my friends said he really liked it. Oh god, is he a Lord of the Rings fan? Yeah, he's like read the books and stuff, and he's god. like, I like it. Well, yeah, then he must just have no awareness of what they're doing to the character. They literally made Galadriel an entirely different character than she is in the book, um, and an entirely different character than she is in these movies. She's just not the same character. She's like a warrior princess, and like that's not even a thing she is. And they like, uh, <laughs> like, like Elrond is like emasculated the whole time or demasculated. What is it called? 
T. Demasculated? Yeah. Like he's just a feminine. That doesn't surprise me. But Elrond is like not that. Like in this in this movie, he's a fucking G. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah, it's just bad, dude. It's all bad. And like I, I would point it out one part of this movie where Gimli's talking about dwarf women and how they're hard to tell from dwarf men. And sometimes they don't even they, there's a theory that dwarf women don't even exist because they're so hard to tell the difference between dwarf men. But like in Rings of Power, there's like a dwarf woman who's like this like fat, I don't know, black girl with like makeup on and like pretty, relatively pretty for like a dwarf. How it's, dare like, you. it's like it's like it doesn't even go along with what we know of in the world. You know, it's like yeah. she's not hard to tell different from dwarf men. You know what I mean? Like I don't, I don't understand. So there's just so many aspects to it that's just like so frustrating and and. Uh, and it, it's all that it's all the woke like bullshit and the you know the agenda pushing that they just try to dump into like J.R.R. Tolkien's fucking world. He's dead, dude. Like, he's he's fucking dead. Like it, 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 at least if you know they go and fuck up George Lucas's shit. Well, George, it was your own fault. You sold away your fucking rights. You know, <clears throat> yeah. like granted, I still think they fucking did him dirty. But still, you you sold your soul to Disney, dude, because you wanted the bread, like, and you wanted to be out. That's your own fault. They took creative liberty over something that you gave up. It's on you. J.R.R. Tolkien has no control, dude. He is dead. You're going to take his book and then make it your own bullshit. Go make your own shit. If you don't want to do it like he he read it, wrote it, then go do something else that's not the name of Lord of the Rings on it. You know what I'm saying? Like, what, what are you what, doing? Well, it's the Rings of Power. It's I, not the Lord I, of the Rings. But so it's still can... based off the Silmarillion, which is fucking J.R.R. Tolkien's writings. So it's like. He, they took his writings, they took their own creative liberty and did whatever the fuck they wanted with it and did a bunch of shit that has that he never even wrote about, did a, stuff, a bunch of stuff that was contradictory to the world he built and the dude is fucking not alive. Like, what the fuck, bro? You know what I mean? It's like, how are you going to drag his his content after he's not... You're all going around selling his shit. Like, he's not here, bro. At least just he's be not faithful. Here, bro. And, and Peter Jackson talks a lot when they talk... When you see, like, breakdowns of, like, behind the scenes... One of his biggest, most number one priorities was staying true to the original content and staying true to what J.R.R. Tolkien wrote. Like, he cared so much about that. And um, we talked about the Saruman's actor felt the same way in the first breakdown of, the, of Fellowship. He was so obsessed with J.R.R. Tolkien's writing that, like, he was even going in there and, like, being a quality control person for certain scenes to make sure that they're, like, making the right kind of sounds and the yeah. orcs, you know what I'm saying? Like, shit like that is, like, yo, we really care about what the, was written in the book. And I, I don't know why uh, people in current day feel like they need to put their political agenda into things that are, aren't supposed to have a political agenda or the political agenda already existed in it but wasn't theirs. It's like, why not just make your own content? If you're that smart yeah, and you want to have you want to push an agenda in a movie, just go make your own story in your own universe, and nobody will care. But I'd be like, "Cool, dude, whatever you want to do." I agree. It's fucking crazy. Doesn't happen though, unfortunately. And I know that you were just—I was just watching your uh, Sorcerer Stone episode, and you were talking about the HBO Max version <clears throat> of uh, Harry Potter. And I, I have a lot of faith in HBO and their adaptations of things. If anybody could, they could. Exactly. But so I can see where a modernization of the Harry Potter film and taking films and taking more time on those two, because I feel like Harry Potter is it, the, the theatrical versions of Harry Potter is very, very harmed by the creative liberty they had to take in order to cram that, those long ass books into one movie. Right. Um, and I, I, I see it when I watch it. I'm like, I was making a joke when I was watching this with the Iceman, you know, uh, M MG the Iceman, who's on the show. Shout out to Iceman. Um, I was, I, I was talking to him about how, like, when I'm watching Harry Potter films, especially the first couple, it's like it feels like it's an and then scene every every scene, and then this happens, and then this well, happens, the, the and then this happens, the and first, then this happens. The first two is not that bad because they kind of incorporate most of the book. Yeah. And then like through the third, especially the fourth on it gets like there's so much that's not in it. It's intense. Yeah, but it's just still just such a rapid fire pace is what I mean because they had to cram all the stuff in from the book. Whereas like if you can spend more time on that and you can take your time on it, I think that you end up getting a lot more out of those stories than you would by, you know, putting them into a movie form. But nonetheless, if they go and take their socio political fucking agendas and shove them into harry potter and try to make them what they want to make them and put what the, put their own beliefs into it and not 
stay true to the original source material. It's like you you just ruin shit. Oh, dude, like, for instance, <laughs> I had someone comment on one of my clips that today. They're like, they were trying to shit on J.K. Rowling for having gay characters. And I was like, there's literally no gay characters in the book. I thought she, like, clearly <clears throat> said Dumbledore was gay. She definitely but, it, but it's not like, she said she always, like, envisioned him as being gay. gay. But, like, it's not explicitly made clear. I saw that comment. And yes, they were over the top because they said everyone's gay, which is just like, where did that come from? But she did retroactively make Dumbledore gay, which is pretty lame. But like, she took the liberty to not put something in there because she didn't think it was relevant. If, if, If there's details about a character she's not going into because it's not relevant to the story, like, good. Like, it doesn't, you don't have to... You don't have to, if you don't have to put it in there because it's not going to add value, then don't. And it's just like making a character gay just to have a gay character, for instance, which I know HBO is probably going to have a gay character at Hogwarts, which there's no gay characters that explicitly are known in the story. So it's like, I'm not saying there's not gay students there, but like there's nothing, there was, sexuality is not really a prevalent thing in the literature. So like, why add it? Yeah, and like, they're going to. They're going to. Inclusivity is all good and fine. I love inclusive things, right? I'm a very inclusive person. I have just as many black people that I hang out with as white people and just as many Spanish people as white people. And I don't really have many Asian friends. Shout out to Asian people. If you want to be my friend, I'm in it. But um, (laughs) I don't... Inclusivity is part of my life. I don't even think about it. But when you force your inclusivity, especially like, you know, your political agenda into content that is already written and created... And already yeah. built with a fan base. We were just talking about the Snow White adaptation that, that Disney's going to do. They're over here talking about how they're going to make Snow White a powerful, like, strong woman character. And I'm over here really trying to figure out, like, who the fuck they're making this movie for. Snow White was popular for, like, our fucking parents' generation, damn near, right? Like, Grandparents. Snow White's like... You know what I mean? And it, this movie was made so long ago. And it's it, 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 it was so big and so popular because of what it was... Why do you feel like you need to change it? If you, if you just adapted it the way it's supposed to be, the way it was originally written, people would show out and you'd get so much fucking money and people would fucking love it. But instead you want to change it for your own political agenda because you think you can do it better than the movie that sold millions and millions of dollars in fucking 1957? Like, what the fuck are you thinking? You know what I'm saying? That shit doesn't make sense. It's backwards to me. I guessed on 1957. Now you know you're going to fact check Because I think it's one of the first. It's one of the first. (laughs) He's going to fact check 37, 37. It's like one of the first. 1937. But But, it's outdated because women should be different now. It's like, fuck you. The reason it's so popular is because people from 1937 all the way to 19 fucking... 99 to 2005 still love that fucking story. Yeah, because Snow White is like the first outside of like Steamboat Willie. Like it's yeah. the first it's the non-Mickey first. Mouse one. How do you how do you take a story that's so beloved and it's, say it's the I, and, original and then t- and then the, as a writer you can be so self-centered and so fucking selfish that you think you can do better than one of the highest selling cartoons of all fucking time. You're like I can do better. Watch me. That's not. That's what I'm saying. That's the same thing that I'm talking about with this uh, this uh, Rings of Power shit. And uh, Rings of Power is more relevant to what we're talking about right here. This Rings of Power shit is you are saying that you can make something better than J.R.R. Tolkien made. And you're saying you're a better writer than him. That's what you're literally saying. How self-centered and stupid do you have to fucking be to think you're a better writer than J.R.R. fucking Tolkien. He, I, his movies I, and books have sold more than damn near everything else combined on the fucking planet. I think the reason they did it is they Amazon wanted a competitor to Game of Thrones. And they fucked up. They lost. I don't think it was, oh, we can write something better. They're like, we can utilize this franchise because you'll automatically get a huge fan base. And it's just like reminiscent to Games of Thrones. Game of Thrones. I get it. But if they stayed true to the source material and really depicted it the way it's written in the books. Well, they could it because they couldn't buy all the rights. I understand. That was, that was why but they, they have the Silmar- Silmarillion. They could follow that exactly the way it's supposed to be. They and then, can't touch and, a lot of this shit. And, but they could build in, this, in the universe, in universe, from what is built in J.R.R. Tolkien. They couldn't take specific stories from specific books. They had the Silmarillion they could use, but they couldn't use anything else. But that doesn't mean you can't build true to the characters in those books. You can. 
they took the liberty to say, no, we're going to change these characters. And no, we're going to do what we want to do with this storyline. And we're going to build our own story within this universe. And it's like, fucking why? Why are you taking that liberty? Money. It's Did it work? No. They're making lots of money. Dude, the, the Rings of Power was the most expensive show in the history of TV. It's true. Do you think they made it back in subs? Maybe. I highly doubt it. I didn't even finish the show. It was so fucking boring. And I'm a fucking Lord of the Rings fan. It was so boring. I mean, I I think it's a 10-year plan for them. It's not going to work. It's a 10-year fail. Um, this, this Epic flop. They've turned a profit as the most watched original to date. For Amazon, I think. It says they're a billion. This source, they could be shitty. This is the one billion investment has paid off after all. Despite going down as one of the most divisive television shows in recent memory, The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, is already turning profit for Amazon as its most watched original to date. But it's relative, I'm sure. I mean, the, what other originals do they have? Fucking Jack Ryan? And what else? Uh, the Boys. Is that good? I've never watched it. Uh, but I hear what you're saying, and it it gets annoying when your beloved things that you fuck with, with literature or film, gets tarnished just because people are trying to make money, and it just ruins how you look at things. Look like at Star Wars or you know Marvel at this point, and maybe Potter, Lord of the Rings. It's like, is any, is nothing sacred? <laughs> Not if Disney touches it especially, but no. yeah, anything Disney touches is like, it, it, it spreads like a, like a disease. It's too bad. Cause they started off good. Like 10 years ago, they were killing it. And then mm-hmm. they just failed. They're just, I mean, it's just bad management. Like, uh, like I'm sorry, but Kathleen Kennedy should have been fired a long fucking time ago. She's fucking god awful. She doesn't give a fuck about Star Wars. She only cares about socio political agendas and and ideologies and bullshit. And she's destroyed fucking Lucasfilm from inside out. I mean, look at fucking Indiana Jones. Fucking lost more money than fucking all of Warner Brothers movies in the past year. What the new one? <laughs> yeah. Fucking, really? What has it done? Uh, it was like a three hundred and fifty million dollar movie, not including marketing, and. I think it's just broken over that. Hmm. Let's see. It's definitely negative. We're At like, least by a couple hundred mil. Ooh, yeah, they're not doing good. Oh, it's bad. It's a, it's an absolute. They fucking might disaster. break even, which is bad. break even on budget, not including marketing. Marketing was another two hundred, three hundred mil. It's a lot. Yeah, it shouldn't be that much, but like, so with that being said, they lost up. Fuck load of money. Fuck load. Mm, they spent around a hundred million marketing. Yeah, so they're down what two hundred mil? Uh, about a hundred ish. It's ugly. That's not good. It's really ugly. But for an Indiana Jones franchise, and why? Why did it happen, everybody? I mean, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is trash for one. Yeah, but it still profited. Yeah, but it always is. Oh, I get what you're saying. Uh, really, the the biggest problem is is that they they didn't make it an Indiana Jones film. They made it Indi- Indiana Jones's niece's film. They made it all about her and how she's better than him and how he sucks and how he's old and how he's shitty and how he doesn't do anything good and quips and quips and quips and quips about how he's not good as Did good as it? women. No, I walked. I watched like fucking thirty breakdowns of it before I even went and saw it because I was like, I don't. I have no interest, and it was all bullshit. Uh, sure. It's all just build up the female lead break down your historically awesome best yeah. fucking character of all time and make him seem like he's inept and incapable. Why the fuck are you doing it? It's called fucking Indiana Jones. It's not called Indiana Jones's niece. Let's watch her do good. I don't understand, but it's all political agenda. It's I'm over it, dude. I'm over you fucking up the movies that we love and the characters we love. And that's why I'm worried for you the most about this HBO shit. Um, because it actually stresses me out. If if they fuck up Harry Potter, even worse, I'll be pissed because they go and do whatever the fuck they want with it. It well, could come out really dope. It could, and you know, I be ranting about how it's not a good idea, and obviously, I want the best for him. But it's like I saw what they did with Fantastic Beasts. Yet 
I understand it's not HBO, but it's still Warner Brothers and the people that are giving the green light and thinking what they've been doing the past six, seven, eight years or whatever with Fantastic Beasts is okay and it's not. And people like it and that's cool, but they're and that that's like on the precipice of me being mad. Like I whatever about it at this point. Cause I'm always like, oh, they could set it up where the next one's good. And then I've watched three now and I'm like, okay, none of them are that good. They're wildly mediocre and they're on the verge of tarnishing everything they've built with Potter. And it's just a bunch of cash grabs and they're, you know, betraying the, the, the lore and the characters that they've built and it's obnoxious. And so, well, yeah. And I think it's funny that you mentioned that because I feel like the fantastic beast franchise is very similar to the Hobbit series yeah. where it's like, it took too much. Uh, it, it, they, they don't last is what I guess I'm saying. Like you don't, the way the Lord of the Rings series is going to go down in history as one of the best trilogies of all time, if not the best in my argument's sake, you in Harry Potter original series goes down as one of the best movie franchises of all time. Right. And that's undoubtable whether I think so or not. It's just objective truth. Um, like you look at the Hobbit and you look at Fantastic Beasts and like people watched them, people like them, sure, but like they're not even close to that commu- that that kind of you know status. They, they don't even they don't even touch it. They're not even in the same fucking realm, and that's because they they have there's too much there's too much just cash grabby bullshit where it's just like oh we're just gonna do this because it's gonna make money and we're gonna do this because it's easy and it's gonna be it's gonna be make the movie look be more fun but it, it takes away from what it's really supposed to be and it's all just to get the quick cash and not have the 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 continuous you know uh forever kind of existence the same way that the sequel trilogy for star wars is right cash grabby bullshit let's just do what's pop- popular now what people will like right now make it fun for little kids who gives a shit and not really care anything about the real lore and the the real star wars that came before it um and it doesn't last the sequel trilogy and the original trilogy of star wars will go down as three of the two of the best trilogies of all time right the sequel trilogy will never ever ever go down to even close that right i i it's funny it just is a random thought that came in my head was even like Deadpool 1 to 2. Like Deadpool 1 is great. Deadpool 2, trash. Yeah. Like I, don't, I don't think it's trash, but again, I don't like it I've all. watched it maybe once, twice. What well, was the theater one time after that? Whereas Deadpool 1, I've watched probably 12 times. So yes, you're 100% right. It's like that there's a, a switch on the intent and what you're going for and it becomes more cash grabby and there's not there's less passion in it and you know that that's all you can really hope for sometimes with these new projects you know with like the hbo max show potter is you know whoever's in control of it really gives a fuck and isn't being a cunt and Mm -hmm. trying to implement stupid ideas that are overly personal to them because you really have to be a, a true artist i think to make these great films like peter jackson did with these films right like peter jackson crushed these and I, I think, undoubtedly, it's one of the best trilogies of all time. And, <clears throat> yeah, I, you know, it's a bummer some of this is happening right now. I think eventually I think it'll pan out. I, I have hope in humanity. I really do. I think the studio you have handling it. I mean, look at The Last of Us, right? You've watched The Last of Us? I, me, I just realized today that I haven't watched that yet. Yeah, you I, have to. So uh, adaptation from okay. source content. One of the best. I've watched a breakdown on like every scene from the the uh, the um, uh, original video game transition to the scenes from the TV show. Almost identical. It's not even like it, it, it's so close. There's some creative liberty they took and some political agenda pushing, but not enough where it's unbearable. It's like uh, there's a whole episode that I don't particularly love, but good character writing and good development it's not like they did a shitty job just to force a narrative they did a really good job while forcing a narrative and that's better than not right and so i think that nonetheless their the adaptation was thoughtful you can tell the people that were behind it really cared about the source material and that's the same people who are going to be working on harry potter so like hopefully if it's if it's and then obviously game of thrones and and um uh uh you know the house of dragons 
You seen House of Dragons? It's another one I gotta watch. Oh my god! So yeah, that's why you don't have faith. Go watch House of Dragons. Go watch Last of Us, and know that that's the studio that's working on Harry Potter, and you will have a lot of faith. You have a ton of faith. Yeah, I like I said, I'm not saying that it couldn't be improved and a and, and what have you. It's just super unlikely. That that's my biggest concern because it is unlikely. There's never been a remake that has been like I like this better. Like has I was trying to think about it. Like I don't think there has been a remake that you liked it better. Like honestly, the closest thing that I can think of is the Lion King thing. I didn't like Lion King better, but I I didn't like it better. But I was like, that was cool. You know, I didn't hate it. They tried to really keep it close to the source material because John Favreau was directing it, Mm -hmm. and he's good at keeping shit close to source material. But outside of that, I'm like. And and that's not even a good example. That's just one that's like wasn't a failure. To it me. wasn't a failure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it was just. Yeah, the only mm. only like adaptation. There's been a couple like little ones. Like I like the new A Team better than like the old one, but I never really watched the yeah, old who, one. Like little I'm shit like sorry, that. but who gives a yeah, who fuck? Who gives a fuck? Yeah, it's about little, the it's little bullshit. Yeah, there's nothing that's like major scale. But <laughs> but the nerdy like I, if if I was to shit. pick a a studio and streaming platform. To remake any of my beloved things, I would pick HBO Max. Yeah. So you are in good hands in that sense. And if they're going to take more time to be able to flush out this story. What they need to fucking do, not to cut you off, but they need to. Cut me the fuck off. They, do well, it. We, <laughs> no, I want you to. The, this is Harry Potter business, dude. Cut me well, off. Well, this is what they, I thought about this today, actually. <laughs> Because I've, people have been like hitting me up with like some of the clips I've been posting about the Potter shit because the episode has just come out. Yeah. And one of the things. I was like, they, if you're going to be get, having an 11, 12-year-old acting as an 11-year-old as Potter's first year, they need to cast at like eight and start working with those kids now. And then like three years from now, these kids are like ready. And that's the only way that I think you can get around getting a full cast of kids to improve the original cast. Otherwise, I don't think you can get a better 11-year-old cast across the board. Like you're just... It's so tough to get so many kids that are even able to act at a decent level. Like I just well, I think so with the little. level of scrutiny that you're talking about, like as I saw the clip you were talking about too, you were talking about how like uh, you and Anonymous were talking about like the level of scrutiny that these kids will get if they don't live up to the original or just cast. get cast. Like you're yeah. fucked yeah. at that point. Exactly, and so yeah, they need to make sure that they're at a top notch. But I think that personally, and this is hot take. Uh, don't get mad at me. Don't take my head off, people. But I don't think that the cast of children from the Harry Potter, especially first couple movies, were good at all. I was saying this before about like the Jake Lloyd thing in Phantom Menace. F- Jake Lloyd was fucking eight years old when he was acting in Fa- Phantom Menace. He was ten. nine. He was nine when the movie came out. No, we. I thought we looked. It was ten. He was ten. It was ten when the movie came out. Sorry. So he was nine when they were filming. It. I'm looking this up. Yeah, he was ten when the movie came out. He was nine when they were filming it. He was born in 1980. Nine, I think you can look it up, whatever it was. But um, he was he was 10 when the movie came out. He was nine when they were filming for sure. But nonetheless, he was a little ass kid. Whereas like even in the 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 Chamber of Secrets, I'm watching Harry Potter's acting uh, Daniel Radcliffe. And I'm like, damn, dude, this this kid cannot fucking act to save his life. Nine. It was nine when they were filming. That's what I'm saying. He was a little ass kid. Whereas like Daniel Radcliffe is fucking 12 years old when they're filming fucking 11 the uh, first one chamber of secrets though when they're filming chamber of secrets he's 12 years old and i'm like this the acting in it is cringeworthy at times where it's like dude figure it out bro and yeah he got better as he got older but like they could have been way better like especially when you look at like uh 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 what's her name um the girl who's in the last of us who was uh mormon i don't know her uh in in game of thrones she was the little kid on bear island the little girl who like ran Bear Island, Mor- mm. uh, Mormon, Mor- I don't remember. Anyway, she was a fucking G when she was that young, and she was like fucking eight, and she was killing that shit. She's like one of the best child actors I ever seen, and I think child acting has gotten to a different level since the early two thousand. That's fair. Um, and I think it could be beneficial for Harry Potter's story to have some really serious child actors taking on that role, then, where then- it doesn't have to be so cheesy and fun like it was when i mean yeah the first two films are like kids films and like that's what we had this brief conversation 
the Even other the day. first three. The I, fir- I mean, I would say like the first four, honestly, mm-hmm. are like kind of kids movies. It like finally transitions at the end of the fourth one once Voldemort comes to fruition. And like that's that's where to me it gets interesting. Once Voldemort is up in this bitch, it's like that's so dope. And like the payoff to me is so cool in those because you watch all these films and they're like cool. I don't care who you are, like I think they're cool to some degree. Like you can enjoy it for what it is. Like it's a cool little concept and then it becomes like oh shit like this is for real for real it gets dark and it's dope and it's kind of intricate to on a lot of levels and the you know five through seven books or five through eight of the films is dope like yeah. or the phoenix on is cool mm-hmm. and i could see the argument the first four the kids aren't good actors and it's a little kitty and a little happy but it's all i it's for someone that likes development you got to appreciate all the development that's going on because you're getting four development m- movies plus four more development movies that also are you know concluding and evolving it's really fun to watch i right, think personally right. but uh, the the i guess my I, I guess my hot take is this is i think that the endeavor of taking on a remake of Harry Potter has the capability of doing better than the original has the capability. doesn't mean they will, but does. Whereas if you took on the endeavor to remake Lord of the Rings, I think it could only get worse. See, I disagree. Cause like they could be better with certain things like in the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. They you could. know they would just use more CGI though, no matter what. Like, there's no way that they remake Lord of the Rings. But and see, like use less. That, that's how I feel about them doing Potter. Is because the way you're perceiving it is the same way I perceive it, and like I'm like they could improve Lord of the Rings, but I know where you're coming from because it's like there's like this edge to the films that you really hold close to you that is unseen in films of late, and it's like I'm not gonna be seeing the same shit that they laid down already. And granted, this is a TV show adaption, so could be dope. But yet again, it's maybe with the shits. And they're, they are remaking The Lord of the Rings, by the way. When? This I don't know. Something that's announced or you just get They've it? announced this. Yes. They're remaking The Lord of the Rings. Yes. Ew. I'm going to throw up everywhere. No. But like, like I said, I look it up. I don't, I don't, I don't have like credible sources. But like, I've heard this and I looked it up. And there's a lot of threads about what uh, New Line Cinema, who are the fuck owns yeah. um, Lord of the Rings. So I mean, it's a cash grab. But I, like, at the end of the day, no matter what, I think a modern day remake of Lord of the Rings only makes it worse. There's no way that you get the experience that was put together from the original film in modern day cinema just based off of the way they film things nowadays not even not even just because of like getting the same actors yeah sure you can't replace orlando bloom or vigo mortensen you can't replace ian mcclellan yeah sure those are all uh, intangibles right but just the fact of the way modern day cinema is filmed now it will never feel the same way or be as good as that original or, or be have as much longevity as that original trilogy. Whereas Harry Potter, especially the first three, four, there's so many things that modern day cinema could make better. Quidditch would probably look way fucking better. Yeah, because remember like, how, how Quidditch looks in Half Blood Prince? It's like dope. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's swagged out. Quidditch would probably look way better. Like a lot of the like the <laughs> sequences where there's just like goofy stuff happening would probably look way better. Like there's so much shit that would like yeah. it, it could on make paper, it better. You know on I mean? paper, yeah. It could. Whereas I don't think Lord of the Rings could. I think Lord of the Rings, no matter what, would get worse. No matter what you did, it couldn't get better. Whereas I think Harry Potter, especially the first four, could get better from having a TV series, spend more time with those characters, and build and actually have real looking sets. You know what I mean? The sets are great on Potter. What are you talking about? There's certain parts where like you're they're flying over Hogwarts and you can just tell it's like this big CGI blob of a of a castle, you know, like just stuff uh, like that, where it's the like fl- the quit, the flying shit is tough for them. It, the first couple, you know months. what I mean? Like it, it could just get those first few films, especially having more time spent with those characters and Whoa. being able to not be so rapid fire action, like thing, this thing happens, this thing happens. Like I want more dialogue and like time spent with learning how these characters are and how they think and what they process like that. That would make me like Harry Potter more as an outside looking in fan. Someone who didn't grow up with them and have nostalgia with those movies. Like, I don't. I didn't have that either. I didn't watch till my 20s and it was just like yeah. a. Yeah. 
whatever, but yeah. Um, but most people who are fans of Harry Potter grew up with them and have the nostalgia thing, yeah. you know. So for me, I don't have that. So I just think that, like, looking at it from an objective standpoint, those those adapted into a TV show kind of excites me. It's like I would get down with watching it and I, seeing if it's good. I'll definitely check it out. I've said that numerous times at this point, but um, you gotta play Hogwarts Legacy, dude. It's one of the best games I've ever played in my life. I know. I heard. Dead you, I heard you talking about it and how good it was. So. Yeah, just from a video game standpoint, like the way they've set it up and the way you play it and the way you interact with everything and the characters all very interesting. I feel like it, it has some Assassin's Creed like relationship when it comes to, like the good Assassin's Creeds, just yeah. the way you play the open world shit. Like yeah, I feel it's like tight. it's similar. Yeah. You just like have a broom and all sorts of shit. You're just like, like flying a broom weirdly is fun. You're like, it's like, uh, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. I mean, so to to wrap it up, I, I don't have how much more. I mean, yeah, I'm good. To to wrap it up for this movie, like I undoubtedly think this is the best three of the trilogy, not the extended cut, the theatrical version. Um, but I do think it's the best out of the trilogy. Um, and I think the trilogy is one of the best of all time, arguably one of the best trilogies of all time, um, if not the best, arguably. Um, and uh. There's, there's, I don't think there'll ever be anything like this movie. If you want to, if you had to pluck one movie out of the last 30 years to say, like, what was the most, like, like coolest feat of <clears throat> cinema, right? There's no way this isn't on your top 10 list. Let's... Right? Objectively speaking. Um, uh, maybe top 25. Interesting. There's things about this film that I think is so well done. Like the makeup, costume design, and the way they make it feel like Middle Earth is really dope. And the characters are very, uh, uh, they make you get really immersed. And yeah, there's, just, it's 24 some, films you'd put in front of someone who's never seen a movie in the history I of the I said world. top 25. I didn't say it was 25. Okay. Well, Hear me out. I guess my question would be like, if you looked met somebody who'd never seen a movie in their entire life, and you're like, I need, I only have a chance of showing the ten movies to exemplify the coolest fucking things about cinema, right? In the last thirty years, it, mm. this would be one of them. It would be. It would have to be. It's I I it was such a hard question to just answer outright and be confident. I just I can comfortably say top twenty five. Yeah. I feel that like because like Infinity War would be one of those for me like like and I know without all the build up it's not as cool but still it's like you got to see that movie like definitely a cool movie. you know what I mean and like to look at the Dark Knight for example like that's one I'd right? like you have to see this I'd say Tron I think Tron's yeah, yeah Tron like there's a couple movies in there where you're just like the the feet at Jurassic Park is a great one right like there's like those movies those pivotal movies that just make up the last 30 years of cinema and like the feats that have been accomplished. And well, the two towers is in my perspective, undoubtedly one of those movies. Yeah. There's a lot in the list. So I think top 25 is still respectable because there's a lot right. of great films Yeah, in the last 30 years. <laughs> Hell yeah. yeah. So but what, what do you rate this film? 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. I knew it. Yeah. No uh, questions. Asked. Do you remember what you rated fellowship? I think it was nine, 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 eight. Mm. I was up there. I think I have it written down. It was either nine nine or nine eight. I think mm. nine nine. Yeah. So you're hitting it with a ten. Ten. Ten out of ten. I'm hitting it with a nine out of ten. I love that. It's a great one. What did you rate the fellowship? Eight seven. Eight seven. Yeah. yeah. Return of the King is not going to get eight seven. No. It won't get nine nine for me. Not even close. <laughs> Is it going to get above a nine? That's a good question for a different day. <laughs> well, because I, I, I just asked because I, I've actually, I was struggling with how I was going to rank Potters mm -hmm. because as a whole, they're like 10 out of 10. Like without a doubt, I don't care what anybody says. Right, like the whole collection. It's the best saga of all time. You have eight films. There's no development. Everything is unparalleled, like in my opinion. Yeah. You could talk shit about the kid acting, but like outside of that, like go get You fucked. think the Harry Potter saga... From is, start to finish. Is the best saga of all time. Is better than the Marvel saga, <laughs> the Infinity bro, Saga. Bro, get the fuck out of here. Really? Deadass. So my point Interesting. is, my point is, is that it was tricky to like. Not for me. 
Not a chance. That's fine. Yeah. So it was just tricky because I wanted to be somewhat fair. Obviously, I'm a little biased, right? Mm -hmm. Naturally. But ranking the lower films on a reasonable scale. Like, I was going to be like, uh, Search for Stone, 10 out of 10. Right. You know what I mean? So, like, I did 8.8 for the first one, 8.9 for the second Mm -hmm. and i feel like that was it's gonna be just 9.0 9.1 kind of 9.3 kind of 9.8 kind of (laughs) but like i had to think about it because like i wasn't gonna be like sword stone was 9.5 because it's not a 9.5 movie and i want to have you gotta be reasonable i be reasonable i'm not trying to be a cunt you know what i mean so it's easy to be biased i don't think i'm being biased by giving two towers a 10 out of 10 i don't think so either right i didn't say you were like but i but i that's why i'm asking like you know, but to be honest, if I was rating the extended cut, it'd be sub nine, probably like an eight point seven. I give it probably like or an eight point five even for me. Like I'm really not enjoyed it. I don't enjoy it. The you made a good point with the pacing, like hard body, <laughs> and I, I was it, it might be like a seven point nine eight. Yeah, like it disrupts the greatness of the of film. That film. Yeah, I know it does. The theatrical version is a, a ten out, to be a ten out of ten and to be an eight something with the extended cut. It's right. really drastic for sure. Like, I would even, after watching this four-hour extended cut, like, I would go back home and just watch the theatrical cut just so I could, like, cleanse myself from that. It's <laughs> funny because, like, I know what you mean. Just like, cleanse it, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's fucking funny. Which, so, I know it's, like, counterintuitive to, like, real Lord of the Rings fans because they really, most of the time, Lord of the Rings fans really get obsessed with all of the little kind of things that were from the book that, you know, like, they... Book readers always do. You know, but for me, it's like, dude, like, to me, it's like, what makes a better movie? Is it with this stuff or without this stuff? And by far, it's without this, you know, without the extra stuff, for sure. Yeah, so overall take on extended cut, I'd rather not watch four hours, and the three hours and the cuts they made were definitely sufficient. And I probably won't ever watch it again. I wouldn't either. Uh, so, yeah. You want to say anything else about plugs? Um, yeah, for sure. Um, big, we're... big fucking plug. And I don't know when this is coming out. Um, it should be reasonably out. Not like the Indiana Jones episode. <laughs> Summer hit and like, yeah. I went to Vegas, you got married. Big like, facts. So there was yeah. things going on. But, but yeah, apologies yeah. on that delay. That was like two months. It's all good. Big, big fucking plug though. Um, first of all, it's John Smith. You spell it John X Smith. You can Google me. You can get at me at johnxsmith.com. You can get at me at mg underscore John X Smith on Instagram. John X Smith on YouTube. It's really easy. So just you can go ahead and tap in anywhere. But I'm dropping this song in the next few days. It's called Super Bad. Um, this is dropping on this Thursday, Friday, this Friday. The song? The song is dropping. Yep. Um, so this episode will be out by the time it sounds out. Okay, awesome. So you will see it. It will be out. It's John Smith. John X. Smith, Super Bad. Um, make sure you tap into it. It's really fucking fire. It's a cool summer jam. Um, it's laid back, but uh, really, really dope. Uh, so you so good, girl. I'm going to call you super bad, and I'm going to let you call me McLovin. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so hey. def- definitely go tap in with it. Uh, but I appreciate you, at, for, as always, one up for having me on the show, especially for these. Um, you Got know, this, you, bro. This, uh, this Lord of the Rings trilogy means a lot to me. And I know I'm appreciative for you having me on for it because, you know, it's, uh, it's my little baby, and I, I'm probably the biggest fan uh, that I know. So. Yeah, no, I know the feeling, so I, I I wanted you to be on here for this this series of reviews, and we did fellowship, and it's been a minute for two towers, and I'm sure, I don't know, maybe we can get Return of the King before the year's out, but I think so. Yeah, next time I'm next time I'm here. Uh, but no, it's a pleasure having you on. I, I appreciate the insight, and it's fun. I think other people fuck with it, and yeah, thanks for on the show. It was for it's, sure. It's definitely fun. I think we've been going for about two hours now. Yeah, I think. Yeah, and if you if you're looking for some more like in depth like trivia stuff, whatever, like we really went hard on the first one when it comes to shit like that. Um, this was more of just a way to be able to kind of dive into this movie and, and go into the details of what we really liked and stuff that we thought could have been better. But like this, this I'm review was definitely different. Yeah, this two tower shit, bro. I'm telling you, like if if you if you you know if you're here still, you obviously love this movie 100 percent because. Um, I don't think you would have lasted this long if you were watching a movie, watching a breakdown of a movie that you didn't really care about. But it's just, uh, it's it's one of a kind in in my perspective. It's definitely a classic, definitely a dope movie. Shout out to everybody a part of it. So, yeah. Thanks for being on the show. Of course. 
that's going to be everything over here at the movie rant break for the Lord of the Rings, the two towers with John Smith and your host. Wanna what up? John Smith hitting it with a 10 out of 10. Boom, your, motherfucker. <laughs> your host hitting it with a nine out of 10. That's everything, everybody. I appreciate y'all for listening to this episode and I'll check you next episode. Later.